If you're a Marvel fan who likes to pour over every frame looking for key details, this is for you. These are the most paused and most pause-worthy moments in Avengers Endgame. In the wake of Captain America Civil War, the various Earth-bound heroes of the MCU were divided in a way we hadn't seen before, and the films that followed directly commented on the fallout from those events. Spider-Man Homecoming showed us how Tony Stark was carrying on and even looking for new members to join the Avengers, while also implying that Captain America was on the run. Black Panther showed us the isolation of Wakanda in the aftermath of King T'Chaka's death. Then Avengers Infinity War came along and delivered Cap's team of secret Avengers, traveling around the world to help where they could. What the film didn't give us, though, was any real presence from Ant-Man and Hawkeye. I'm so confused. These are confusing times. <laughs> Turns out that after Civil War, both Scott Lang and Clint Barton were put under house arrest for their roles in helping Cap. Scott got a whole movie devoted to his predicament with Ant-Man and the Wasp, but Endgame was the first film we saw Clint dealing with his own confinement. If you look closely in the film's cold open, you can see the consequences, if only for a moment. Pause at just the right time, and you'll spot an ankle monitor around Barton's leg, similar to the one Scott Lang had to wear. When it comes to the world of Marvel Comics and its translation to the big screen, there are some Easter eggs that will never get old. We could never get enough Stan Lee cameos, and it was always fun to see a famous comic creator's name show up on a street sign or a storefront. And of course, diehard Marvel fans are always happy to see a certain three-digit number. When Avengers Endgame opens, Scott Lang is still trapped in the quantum realm, and he's only freed because a rat steps on the controls for the quantum tunnel in the back of his van, which has long since been moved into a storage unit with the name Lang on the sign. And beneath the name is the unit's number. 616. That number has long been associated with the prime Marvel Universe in the comics continuity, the reality where all of Marvel's main stories are set. There are multiple realities, Peter. This is Earth, Dimension 616. I'm from Earth 833. The 616 gag has been used before in the films. Dr. Selvig wrote it on a chalkboard in Thor The Dark World, for example. But it's always nice to pause for a moment and just smile at the reference. Avengers Infinity War had to pack on a lot of plot into an already long movie, which means that there were plenty of questions from the film that Endgame needed to spend some time answering. One of those loose ends was a character from Thor Ragnarok who became a fan favorite and then was conspicuously absent from the brutal opening of Infinity War. So, what happened to Thor's rocky pal, Korg? My name is Korg, I'm kind of like the leader in here. I'm made of rocks, as you can see, but don't let that intimidate you. You don't need to be afraid unless you're made of scissors. <laughs> Thankfully, Avengers Endgame lets us know early on that Korg and his best friend Meek survived the slaughter of the Asgardians and are now living with Thor at the new Asgard on Earth. Like the God of Thunder, both former gladiators have become couch potatoes, hanging out in the house all day and playing video games. It's a funny reveal, but it includes more than just the news that Korg is alive. If you freeze the scene on one of Korg's shots, you might notice that he's adopted some Earth clothes, namely a pineapple print shirt and shorts. It might seem like just a funny costume choice, but it's actually a nod to the actor who plays Korg, Thor Ragnarok director Taika Waititi, who's been known to walk a red carpet or two in a pineapple printed romper. Stan Lee was a constant presence in the world of Marvel-based films for decades thanks to his many, many cameo appearances. After popping up in the more separated universes of the Spider-Man and X-Men trilogies, Lee became a prominent fixture of the MCU, appearing in nearly every Marvel Studios film in one form or another to the delight of fans. Sadly, Lee passed away in the fall of 2018 at the age of 95. And Avengers Endgame marked the last time we'd see Lee's instantly recognizable face in a new cameo. Thankfully, for all of us, it was a memorable appearance. Lee showed up at the beginning of Tony Stark and Steve Rogers' time heist in New Jersey in 1970, speeding past an army base in a muscle car. Lee's retro look for the cameo is reason enough to freeze the frame, but if you pause at the very beginning of the scene and look at this car, you'll notice a Nuff Said bumper sticker prominently displayed. Along with Excelsior, Nuff Said became one of Stan the Man's most popular catchphrases back in the days when he was still writing regular letter columns in the pages of Marvel Comics, and it's a nice nod to the Stan of the 70s. You know, I guess one person can make a difference. Nuff Said. Though he might not have the same high profile as characters like Captain America, Thor, or Iron Man, the superhero known as Ant-Man is actually one of the oldest characters in the Marvel Universe. 
Hank Pym and his incredible shrinking powers debuted all the way back in 1962 in the pages of Tales to Astonish, and the character went on to become a founding member of the Avengers. Pym's long journey to the big screen meant that by the time we finally did see him in the MCU, the story focused more on the second Ant-Man, Scott Lang. Hi, I'm Scott. Did he just say, hi, I'm Scott? And it made Pym into a legacy hero whose adventures in his prime we see only in flashback. However, Avengers Endgame offers an opportunity to pay homage to this legacy with a time travel trip back to 1970, when Pym was still a young doctor working in a S.H.I.E.L.D. lab. Though Pym's Endgame time is little more than a cameo appearance, we get to see a brief glimpse of an early Ant-Man helmet on a table in his lab. If you pause to admire the headgear for a moment, you'll see that it's a design lifted from Pym's very earliest comic book appearances. Avengers Endgame is three hours of pure comic book-fueled adrenaline, so there are plenty of moments worth hitting the pause button on. If we had to pick just one, though, if there was only one scene in the film worth freeze-framing over and over again, it's the moment when the story's climax kicks into high gear. Steve Rogers, battled and hobbled by his battle with Thanos, refuses to stop fighting. He stands up as Thanos' army gathers on the horizon, prepared to go down swinging in the battle to save the Earth. Then he hears his friend Sam Wilson's voice in his head, and the portals open up all around him. Suddenly, Captain America is surrounded by an army of allies from Wakanda, the Sanctum Sanctorum, and beyond. The crowd that gathers so Cap can, at long last, say those famous words. Assemble. No! It's truly an amazing sight, and it's worth pausing on to highlight as many characters as possible. Bonus points if you can find Howard the Duck in the ranks. The build-up to the climactic battle is an amazing moment, full of appearances from resurrected heroes and plenty of freeze-frame-worthy shots. Even after all that build-up has landed, though, the showdown itself offers plenty of individual spotlight sequences that are worth focusing on. As the camera zooms through the massive battlefield, virtually every major Marvel character gets at least one moment to shine. It's a glorious series of moments, but one in particular seems to stand out above the rest. At one point in the battle, our heroes decide they need to get the Infinity Gauntlet over to the quantum tunnel to keep it away from Thanos. As Peter Parker tries to hand the gauntlet over to Carol Danvers, every major female hero in the fight surrounds her, and they prepare for an all-out assault on Thanos' forces. Is it a move that feels like pure fan service to some? Maybe. But creating a team of all-female Avengers, known in the comics as A-Force, if even for a few seconds, is still cheerworthy, as is their charge into battle seconds later. The arc of the overall MCU sometimes builds slowly in the background, but it's there, and Avengers Endgame made that especially clear by serving as both a loving guide to the MCU's past and a conclusion to the story of Tony Stark. The film is an emotional, devastating ending to Tony's journey from selfish tech genius to savior of the universe, and the payoff of that journey feels like a satisfying conclusion to not just this film, but the decade of movies that came before. This all culminates in the Avengers holding a memorial service for Tony outside his family home, and the camera lovingly pans across what's essentially the universe he created as the first MCU hero. We see each franchise represented in turn, all given suitable reverence, but then the camera briefly hovers across a sad young man standing by himself, as moviegoers scratch their heads and go, huh? If you or someone in your home is still confused about that kid at the funeral, hit pause and study his features. He's grown up a lot, so it's understandable if you didn't recognize him at first, but that's actually Harley Keener, the budding child inventor from Iron Man 3 who helped a stranded Tony Stark when he most needed a friend. I would have added in, um, the retro... Retro reflective panels? To make him stealth mode. You want a stealth mode? Cool, right? That's actually a good idea. In other words, Harley more than earned his spot at that funeral. Back in Avengers Infinity War, Thanos promises that if he gets what he wants, he'll finally go someplace to rest, proud of the years of labor it took to finally make his dreams a reality. In Endgame, we get to see what that rest looks like. And for Thanos, at least, it seems rather nice. Wounded and weak in the wake of his battle with the Avengers and his effort to destroy the Infinity Stones once and for all, the film finds Thanos at home on an isolated garden planet, harvesting crops and relaxing in what looks like a simple hut. He's also found a new use for the armor he wore through all his years of fighting. It's now a scarecrow watching over his fields. On the surface, this is a nice symbol, an indication that Thanos has indeed committed to no longer fighting anything or anyone. 
Before the Avengers show up, he seems truly relaxed and content in his new surroundings, and the Scarecrow is a good indication of that. But Marvel Comics fans know that the imagery carries a deeper meaning. If you pause the movie at this point and then go back and look at the final pages of the classic 1991 story, The Infinity Gauntlet, you'll see a direct parallel to the end of that story, in which Thanos is exiled to live out his days as a simple farmer after his defeat. In the wake of the snap, each of the surviving Avengers learn to cope in their own way. Steve starts support groups. Bruce learns how to deal with both halves of himself. Thor descends into a life of booze and video games. Tony starts a family, and Clint goes on the warpath after losing his wife and kids. Then there's Natasha, who decides her place is in the Avengers compound in upstate New York, where she coordinates superhero operations on Earth and beyond, because it's the only thing she knows how to do. She also, apparently, takes some solace in certain aspects of her past. I used to have nothing. And then I got this. In the scene where Steve visits Natasha at the compound, one wide shot reveals an interesting nod to Natasha's unconventional upbringing. If you pause at the right moment, you'll see a pair of ballet shoes on a chair. This is a nod to Natasha's past as a young girl trained to be a Russian assassin. The ballet was part of the physical training along with her journey to becoming a cold-blooded killer. And perhaps as she grew older, it was one of the few things she still enjoyed about that period in her life. We'll learn more about Natasha's past in the Black Widow solo film, and this little Easter egg is a nice nod in that direction. Check out one of our newest videos right here, plus even more Looper videos about your favorite films are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.